Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Head to Head, an Open Dialogues production. And it's a real pleasure tonight to introduce someone to you. Now, many of you who are football fans will recognise this man's face even before I let him start talking because he hasn't changed a jot. But he has disproved for me the old saying when they say, never meet your heroes. They always, you know, they're not what you make them out to me. Well, I've met Mel and we've been friends now for a while. And I've got to say, he's lived up more than I would have expected. He's an absolutely top bloke and I'm really proud to be friends with him. And let me, before we get into it, I just want to say, Mel Eves, club appearances, 243, goals, 67, Wolves, Huddersfield, Sheffield United and England B team, as well as other clubs along the way, but a great career and a very interesting man who we're going to have a really fun hour with now. And uh, believe you me, the conversation is going to go into things that you perhaps wouldn't have expected. It's going to be fun. So first and foremost, Mel Eves, thanks ever so much for joining the show, mate. Great to see you. An absolute pleasure, Bill. Um, we've got an ever got on ever so well uh since a few years ago when when we when we got to know each other better because uh, we knew each other before but um you know since since you got back into uh the swing of things around bilston wolverhampton after doing your uh you know your, your, your stint in the uh in brussels and what have you so uh no no it's been been wonderful uh, well it's great and, and it's a real real pleasure to have you on so there's going to be one or two people, bear in mind we have viewers watching this from all around the world. So there might be one or two people who don't really know the, the story and maybe a few others who might be surprised by some of the details of it. So let's get warmed up before we go into everything else. But let, let's talk about Mel Eves, his football career and, and how it all started and, and where you came from. Because I know you, you came, you're one of those rare events, a, a footballer who actually came from the area that he, and the club he represented. Uh, you know, you're one of us, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, I'm very blessed in the fact that I was born into a wolf supporting family. I was born in a little fishing village between Wolverhampton and Warsaw called Darlaston. And uh, I was born in a pub. It was, the pub was the Dartmouth Arms, colloquially known as the Stump, which is down now. It's very close to where probably the, the big Asda supermarket is in in Darleston. And um, I then moved from there when I was uh, a year, a couple of years old to the Herbert's Park Tavern uh, in Forge Road, which is still there. And um, I played football for them, by the way. That, yeah. I played. I didn't realise that. I played for their pub team. Probably it's a slightly different level to what you might be used to, but I did play. Anyway, carry on, mate. You just surprised me with that well, one. There's so there's a connection we didn't know about that you've just you've just brought up. And then uh, when I was seven years old, uh, my dad and mum moved to the um, the Red Lion in Wensfield, and, and he kept that pub for about twelve years till I was nineteen, just just after I signed professional for Wolves, um, and uh, my dad retired. He was sixty four, sixty five at the time, anyway. So and then he. He went on to do some other things for the the local brewery and what have you. But um, uh, so yeah, it was wonderful being a wolf support sporting lad. Um, and actually, wolves was all the talk in the pub. So I I have kind of the DNA of Stan Cullis, Billy Wright, Bert Williams, um, Jimmy Mullen. Hancock and Mullen, the two great wingers who I who, who I met Jimmy Mullen first when I my first pair of football boots was my dad took me to Jimmy Mullen's shop in Broad Street right. and um, and then I met the great Johnny Hancock's when I actually played for Wolves. He was introduced in the dressing room once um, about half past two, three o'clock kickoff, and there was a knock on the door, and one of the the directors just brought in little Jimmy Hancock, uh, little uh, Johnny Hancocks. And, uh, and of course, that was a name that I'd been kind of brought up with, and, and, but I'd never met the guy. They always said he was a little guy, which he was, um, and, but he was one of the, the greatest players that's ever played for the club. Oh, what a lovely man. What a lovely man. And, Bill, it made my day. Because I, I went on to have a, 
a decent game for me anyway and uh loved it and you know what he said because i went to sh i went when i got the opportunity and he just come in and said oh, all the best lads just wanted to to say whatever because he was introduced as and then for me as a wolves fan some of the other lads wouldn't have obviously it wouldn't have made m much sense to them but for me and i just made sure i just shook his hands johnny absolute pleasure and he went oh mel mel he said uh I just want to tell you," he said. "You're my, you're my wife's favourite player." <laughs> oh, hey, so, about I, that. so I was Johnny Cox's uh, Mrs.'s favourite player. So I, I was that made my day. That did absolutely wonderful. Well, I should think so. Yeah, I should think so. I mean, that, that's that's quite a claim to fame. That is that amongst all. The, I should have read that out in your introduction. That's that's well, not, quite well, something. Not, well, not a lot of people know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Well, they do now. They do. They now. do. They do. Um, but I mean, the, the great thing was when you were you first went to Wolves. Wolves were, were a, a pretty sensational team, um, and when you were, you know, trying to break through into that, you got some fairly serious competition up front. Had you some names that? You well, know, we, we're talking off air about people who'd make it as any any era of football. Well, you know, some of the people who you were involved with at that time, well, they're, they're legends. Yeah, well, the first time that I went to Wembley, I was still at school. I was just, uh, I went to the Wolverhampton Grammar School and uh, I was in the, just got in the sixth form. When it, 1974, my first visit to Wembley was when Wolves beat uh, a star-studded Manchester City team 2-1. And two of my favourite players, Kenny Hibbett and John Richards got the winner, um, scored the goals to, to win the game. So... Anybody had said to me then, because I didn't know then when at that game that I would then a year later be joining them in at, at, on the playing staff. Because yeah. in 75, I, jo I joined. Uh, so just over a year or so later, 16, 17 months later, I, I was there. Um, so you could pinch me. And then the next time I play at Wembley, my second visit to Wembley, Instead of sitting in the stands and watching it, I'm playing. Yes. And I was playing, and the shirt that I had was number 11. And obviously somebody had, who'd played, who played at number 11 in the 74 Cup final, the one and only great Dave Wagstaff, Waggy. Oh, yeah. Um, who was probably one of the best left-wingers I've mentioned already mentioned Jimmy Mullen, but probably Jimmy Mullen and then Dave Wagstaff are probably two of the best number 11s that Wolves have ever had. And um, when I say number 11s, I mean left wingers, because obviously they've got squad numbers now. So it's, it's, yeah. it's changed in the last few years. But for, for, for most uh, viewers and listeners uh, tuning in now, <laughs> it's, yeah, we, we'll remember 1 to 11. Yes. One's your goal. Yeah. One's your goalkeeper. Two's your right back. Three left back. Five your centre back. Number nine's always your centre forward. So seven right winger and all that. So uh, yeah, for me to then wear number eleven, and then when I came there, obviously I made my debut, and I had to wait a couple of years to to get into the team because it was the competition was so fierce because Wolves were in the top league, and they're just a couple of as well as them winning the league cup the year before. Uh, they'd finished fourth in the league a few seasons before and also got to the final of the UEFA Cup. So the yeah. team was one of the best teams in the country, easily one of the top 10 teams, if not the top six teams at the time. As well, uh, you know, coming back, that Wolves had fallen down a bit from probably being the best team in the 50s, along with then Man United took over probably after the, uh, the, the Munich air disaster and what have you. Hmm. But, Wolves, Wolves were one of the best teams, not only in this country but in Europe in 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 the fifties, which put Wolves on the map worldwide. Really, we well, started um, the floodlit uh, friendlies as well, which were the precursor to the European Cup, weren't they? That was the, and you've just said that's the big thing that put Wolves on the map was the floodlit games at, uh, against the the Honveds and the Moscow uh, Spartak and. Real Madrid and everybody. So it was, um, yeah, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful times. 
Um, and that, as I say, I was born in the 50s. So that's kind of in my DNA growing up um, that it was just going in without me realising it. Um, and then, um, you know, to meet, to meet the, the guys that, you know, at Billy Wright, met, met him on a few occasions, even Stan Cullis, but then Billy Wright, um, Jimmy Mullen, Johnny Hancocks, Roy Swinburne, another absolute legend. What a lovely man. Um, and uh, I remember being invited once by Roy Swinburne to speak at his Rotary Club when he was the president of the Rotary Club of Stowbridge. And uh, uh, so, yeah, many, many, many happy memories, yeah. yeah and, and that side that you you broke your way into and forced your way through with a lot of endeavour. And also, let's remember as well, you spoke about the League Cup final in 1980. You you played a significant part in getting us there as well, as I recall, didn't you? You played well, in, in the, um, was it the semi-final of the quarter final? You, 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 you notched, I'm, I'm sure I can recall you were a major part of that. Yeah, I notched a couple of times during the cup run. I think um, at Crystal Palace earlier on, we... I scored well. I think we won two one there, and then um, the semi final was probably what you're referring to, Bill. In the fact yes. that I didn't play in the first game, but I came back for the second game. I was just left out in the first game. I wasn't injured, but uh, I think Dave Thomas, who top lovely lad, Dave Thomas, great great player, England and Everton QPR um, played, and then um, but I. I was put back into the in this in the second one and we were two one down against a really good really good Swindon time a really good Swindon town team at the time and uh we would we were drawing one one with about under 10 minutes to go and uh the ball towards the, at the south bank end on the corner of the corner of the penalty area the ball just kind of popped up and just instinctively, I just over red kicked it, and fortunately went in went right in the far corner, and it was um, two one, which then took us into extra time, and then the king himself, John Richards, got the winner in extra time, which took us through to Wembley. So it was a bit, it probably was um, important that I got that goal at the time. Well, yeah, probably was, and I can't think of many people who'd be so understated about scoring an overhead kick in a cup semi final. I mean, fair, fair play. But, but, but the number, <laughs> but, but there are, there were one or two people that said, um, "Oh, that was lucky," <laughs> and, and and I said, "Well, I said, well, yeah, I didn't actually pick because I couldn't. I didn't actually pick kind of which which part of the." of the net, which little piece of the netting it was going into. Cause I couldn't see it. Cause I got me back to goal, didn't I? Yeah. Which you do, if you do a whole, an old red yeah. kick, that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I said, um, but the thing is instinctively, you just know where the goals are. And that's what well, that's you practice. That's a good forward, isn't it? Well, that's what you practice. The thing is that, that um, people ask the same question. I think it was to, Jack Nicholas or Lee Trevino, one of the famous, you know, best goal, uh, golfers in the world. And they said, uh, oh, that was a bit lucky at, um, at the 17th. And they said, and, uh, they said uh, what do you mean, lucky? And Because what he'd done, he'd, he'd, he'd actually hold in from one of the bunkers where you could, it was that deep, you couldn't actually see that the green, let alone the flag. Yeah. And he said he'd gone straight in. And uh, and all his answer was, well, the more you practice, the luckier you get. Absolutely. And he said, yeah, is that the truth? And what was the idea? What was the idea of me getting out of the bunker? I'd got to get as close to the hole as I could. Because there's two things. There's getting out the bunker, but I could have done that. But it could have been I could have been a mile away from the hole. So if I get out the bunker, it's like me doing the old red kick. You know what am I trying to do? It's I'm trying busy. to score. I'm, oh, well, I'm trying to score. Yeah. I don't consciously pick out there because I, I can't consciously pick out of oh, the keepers. The keepers there, so I've got to put it there, which I could do if I was facing him. 
you just go in there, you just you just execute your shot, you just execute your shot like you would execute the golf shot. But you're always trying to get it as close to the hole. The fact that you wouldn't, the fact that you're not gonna you, you're gonna score a, a much lower percentage of that that opportunity that crops up, you're gonna score it once in a blue moon. The fact that I scored it then, that's all credit to us. It's like Jamatinho's goal this year. It'll probably you know, there's every, every chance it's going to be his only goal this year. But if no, you don't, have, yeah, but it's but it was a absolutely great strike against Arsenal, wasn't it? We've got to mention Arsenal because of our little chat with Dan early before. But it yes, was a great. The, the, the producer of the show is a big Arsenal <laughs> fan, so we're, we're <laughs> at the risk of being cut off air. We, we just thought we'd have a little dig in there and mention it. We might mention some more uh, stuff about uh, scoring against Arsenal later, just to keep him keep him on well, his. Well, that's toes. right. We just we just. We were just uh, thinking how we could work it in without it being too obvious, Bill. <laughs> yeah, I think we managed it, Mel. I think we got we most. Oh, yeah, little sign coming across that this will be edited out. Too late, Danny Sly. So yeah, well, I mean, I personally, I'm, gonna, I'm so glad you did score that goal in the semi-final because I, well, I, I the, was as well. <laughs> well, I went to the final with my dad. <laughs> my dad and my uncle took me to that as a as a ten year old. Uh, my first trip to Wembley, and I was there, and uh, and I saw that. What I I still say to this day is one of the most remarkable wins because yeah, Wolves Wolves were good, but they were playing Nottingham Forest, and Nottingham Forest in that era were absolutely unbelievable, oh, yeah. unbelievable. And I you know I, 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 the odds must have been stacked against us, and and to win that final. I think it's it's got to stand out as one of the greatest achievements that Wolves have ever done, you know, under the circumstances of who they were playing. Well, I think we we just um, it was a different type of game, but I think we just did the same as the Wolves team against Man City, because Man City were were odds on favourites as well as City um, Forest were favourites against against us in in nineteen eighty. Um, they weren't. It wasn't as there wasn't a, a massive difference. But they were certainly favourites because the thing is that they they were used to the bigger bigger occasion. We'd only got three or four players that had played in the seventy four game. Yes, we'd got Emily Hughes, who was obviously used to the big occasion with yeah. uh, having played at Wembley many times with both Liverpool and of course England, and um, so that helped settle settle everybody down. Um, you know, and then the younger lads such as myself, George Berry, Paul Bradshaw, uh, Peter Daniel, etc., who hadn't played, who hadn't played there. Um, we, we, uh, you know, we, 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 we were just in the right frame of mind. We, we were just comfortable in the fact that we, we knew we'd got, we'd got a really good team. That if we played as we did. For the whole of that season, um, we knew we could beat more or less anybody on our day. So we just got to we, we we just trusted everybody trusted everybody else to do their jobs, and that was the big thing. And I'll also tell you a little secret Go in on. that um, we knew we knew there was nobody that went there for the ride because after we'd beaten. I think it was a Tuesday night after we'd beaten Swindon in the second leg and got through to extra time and got through to Wembley. Um, we were asked to come in the following day, half 10, not to train because we were then going to train on the Thursday to prepare for the Saturday game. Cause I think we'd got two, three games before the final mm. and uh, three league games before the final. And then, uh, but he just sat John Barmel and Richie Barker just sat everybody down, said, Obviously, well done last night. Absolutely brilliant, lads. We knew then who we were going to play, that we were playing Forrest, who'd got through against Liverpool, who, were, who went on to win the league that year. Yeah. <laughs> Liverpool just pipped Manchester United that year as well. And um, so, and they'd beaten them, what, I think, what, the two legs were 1 0 and 0 and 0 0. So they just squeezed past a very difficult game, very tough game against Liverpool. So we knew it was going to be tough, and um, it, they were the current European Cup uh, holders as well. 
yeah. and that a few months after we'd beaten them, they went on to retain the European Cup, which is a feat in itself. There's only people like your Real Madrid's do that, um, yeah. but For Forest actually did it, and um, you know it just goes to show that it was a great was a great achievement. But typical John Barnwell, Richie Barker sat us down, just sat there. Well done, lads. You know, hope you had a, a good night because obviously go out and celebrate a bit. Because, yeah. uh, okay, settle down now. We'll get back into it tom tomorrow because we've got a big game Saturday. Right. I don't want anybody thinking about, thinking that they're going to go. If anybody thinks they're going to go to Wembley just for a day out and we're going to go there to make the numbers up, you can get out the room now. And he just said, we are going there. We know that we can, as I was just said, we can beat anybody on our day. Yeah. Which we had. We'd beaten we'd, we we literally that year, I know I'm not very popular with some of my fans that are Man United supporters. Uh, we did the double over Man U that year. And that and if you look at the table, Liverpool picked Man United by two points. Well we and gifted if, them. That, that's us then Liverpool fans can thank us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um and I think they went. They then went thirty odd years without winning it, but um, until Klopp come. But yeah, but this this is it. It's just all all, all fine margins. But yes, well, it was it was a fine margin in that final. So the the goal itself was uh, Peter Daniel long ball and Dave Needham chests it past Peter Schilter and Andy Gray runs onto it and tips it into the net, doesn't he? And uh, yeah. you know that that in itself was was. Um, Quite something because you know that Nottingham Forest defence didn't make many mistakes, did they? Well, well it, it 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 was it was a little bit of good fortune. They always say that if you're going to win the cup, you, if your name's on the cup, you'll win it. Um, and that probably. Uh, but apart from that, we did a we did a really good job on on Forest that day. They didn't yeah. have much. Um, Paul Bradshaw didn't have to make that. It, what saves he, he made, he did very well. Because Brady yeah. was a top top keeper, by the way. Yes. And um, but everybody just worked their socks off, and everybody knew what they were doing. Okay, we were a little bit under the cosh after we went one nil up, and for the last twenty minutes, we probably retreated a little bit too far back. But having said that, the goal, you know, it wasn't as if Forrest were peppering our goal. We 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 just kept our shape very well, and uh, we were always difficult to beat. Yeah, and John Richards had a, what looked like a perfectly good goal disallowed. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of us are still scratching our heads. But the thing is, because it's Peter Shilton, the England goalkeeper at the time, the referees feel sorry for the keepers, don't they? If if oh, you yeah. blow on them, you know, that's it. Oh, foul against the keeper. It's the easiest thing to do, really. Yeah, but John Richards wasn't exactly a, a giant of a man, was he? And you know, Peter Shilton was was twice the size of him. Anyway, I was I was I was in that stand looking down. And I thought, well, where's the foul? But you know, there wasn't. Uh, well, no. you're quite quite right, Bill. I know we're bi I'm biased certainly, and you're probably biased. I'm in slightly the biased. Yeah. In the fact <laughs> of saying, well, you're right. There wasn't a foul, <laughs> but it was one of those things. But yeah, the, it was um, yeah happy days and. Uh, of course, we then went on to, because we finished sixth in the league that year, qualified for Europe. We went into Europe, and um, who was, you know, if you'd have said if you'd have said to any Wolves fan, oh, it's uh, it's going to take you nearly another four, 40 years, not 30, 40 years for for the club to get back into Europe after that. Yeah. Um, after we we went out against uh, PSV Eindhoven, you're thinking, well. No, it's not good. That's 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 crazy. But um, we 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 just weren't a force. It was it, it was just crazy that in a few years the the club was going to go on a big downward spiral, and then and then come come back with obviously um, you know the the what you call the bully the bully era and what yeah. have you, and then and Sir Jack. Um, Graham Turner, obviously, um, he's the, you know the lads there, Robbie Dennis and um, and uh, all, all of the lads in, involved were uh, 
it was br- it was brilliant. You know, young Andy Thompson. I think it was the the three of them come at the same pretty pretty well the same time, didn't they? Tom uh, yeah. bully Tomo and uh, and Robbie. So well, Albion were being very generous to at the time to us at the well, time and giving us these players, weren't they? Well, that was it. Yeah, they just I think they felt they, they felt sorry. I think Ron Saunders was manager at the time, wasn't he, or something? So. Yes, yeah, he, he was a good judge of talent, wasn't he? He, he said Steve Bull couldn't score a goal. Yep, top top judge. I'm, I'm glad he was the manager at the time. Well, I think that, that was the that, that was the the thing, wasn't it? Saying that his his first his first touch wasn't quite good enough for for, for whatever. The problem was that what he didn't what he didn't say was that his second touch usually ends up in the back of the net. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Royce. Exactly. So uh, well, it was, but, but it's a lower level than you played, Mel. That, 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 it, was, that, you know. it was. It was. a Wolves. Yeah, it was. But it, it's horses for courses, and it, it was. It's different times, and and that's what Wolves needed, and um, that was brilliant at the time. Just what it we was. just just what the doctor ordered, so to speak, and um, got us back with a bit of respectability and pride to the uh, to Wolves, and uh, you know, as a world world-renowned team and uh, it got got the city back back into some kind of shape and then and then wow the last few years with under new now has, has really put the city back back on the map you know yeah, so very, uh, very different story nowadays which is which is absolutely wonderful and all credit to uh the you know new owners Fosen and and obviously, new now in his um, backroom team and and everybody connected, um, and then bring in you know it's great to see some certainly world class players now back at you know with Wolves. We had it in my day, obviously in the fifties with the great Billy Wright, but even when I played, you know, f- for Wolves to be to make the the country's major highest um transfer fee paid for a player with andy gray uh you know then then for us to sign the england captain although he just coming off but he was he'd still played for england under uh, when he was at wolves played he yeah. probably played his last game for england but he was at wolves at the time so and uh, you know well, crazy it, horse emily hughes himself the uh and emily yeah, and, em, and emily was you know, was was an inspired signing um, by John Barnwell. And would you um, would you compare him to Connor Cody in some respects, the, the current Wolves captain? Well, very similar. Obviously, the, the both um, both Liverpool captains, both centre backs, um, very influential in the dressing room and on the pitch. So yeah, big. There's a big similarity there. Um, yeah, well, I've, I've thought that myself because I think captaincy on a football pitch is often underrated because you you know sometimes occasionally you'll see a player made the captain perhaps because he's the best player or but you know perhaps because there's an ego trip going on. But the, the, when you see a real captain who actually well, leads, it makes a, such a difference. The captain, the captain at the time when I actually joined Wolves, was one of the most influential and best captains that Wolves have ever had. Um, you know, you could say. Obviously, in the fifties, you got Billy Wright, um, and then Bill Slater. Um, you know, to mention a, a couple of outstanding Wolves legends. But then, at my time, it was Mike Bailey, and Mike Bailey was the skipper. And every other every other player in that dressing room knew that Mike Bailey was the captain, and it was. Most of them didn't call him Mike or or. Manny or or whatever it was skip yeah it was just he was the skipper skip yes skip <laughs> and and that was it so um he had absolute total respect from everybody um you know and every every manager that was there especially mcgarry because i i only had one year under bill mcgarry but um it was then sammy chung that gave me my debut but um by the time I'd got made my debut, McBailey was on his way out because I played a few, quite a few games with Mick in the reserves. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and what have you, but there were two, probably two or three years where he had a, 
really massive impact and was very influent influential with my um getting doing the things i needed to do to to improve my game and get give me a chance of getting in the first team at wolves and there are there are lots of other players that fit into that category as well that really helped because you, you'd got some you know wonderful wonderful players that help the younger lads you know so and i've mentioned dave wagstaff uh phil parks was great with everybody uh, john richards was the pfa rep and was was wonderful with all the younger lads as was you you know your kenny hibbits and jeff palmers and everybody they were great all good well, well i'm interested in the, the subject of leadership because it, it a little bit later on in this discussion we're going to talk about some of the work you've done latterly and there's a lot of a lot about leadership personal development and things like that we want i want to discuss with you um but of the, the leaders in terms of managers that you played under you i guess you saw some really different styles through bill mcgarry sammy chung and john barnwell and so on and so forth but which one sort of stood out for you or were they all good in their different ways you know how, how would you assess them i think i learned a lot from from all of the managers that are played under um you know both from um sammy chung that gave me my debut through to um obviously john barnwell was john barnwell and richie barker were, were were brilliant um graham hawkins especially was was excellent man manager um he played for the club and then when the do derek duke came in with when the with the batties i think in 82 yeah. 82 83 we just got relegated um but we came straight back and i i then played up front playing with two of the best strikers that I've ever played for the club, John Richards and Andy Gray. I played wide for, for a couple of, two or three seasons. And then when John was coming towards the end of his career at Wolves, he was going to Portugal. I played up front with Andy Gray. Um, and then I finished that season as top scorer with that. And, and Andy Gray and then Wayne, young Wayne Clark was coming through. And yeah. all, th all three of us, got into double figures that year and we just we just missed winning the league i think we, we but we went up with um qpr um we went straight we went straight back up to to the premier league as it is now or division one then so um but that was a great season so graham hawkins was first class but then the rug was pulled from underneath him because we knew i mean andy gray said it uh kenny he, he beat said it there was quite a few you know still a few of the um the more experienced lads there and we just need just need a couple of players to add to the squad and we'll be fine in the division one never got them in fact players left we saw andy gray was snaffled up by everton for a cup price two hundred and fifty thousand pounds after we bought him for a, a record fee of a million and a half yeah. and uh he then went on to <laughs> to i think win the league win the fa cup win the european cup winners cup with with everton in three se two or three seasons so um it was probably one of the the best buys pound for pound that everton have ever made in their life well it was it was an absolute giveaway and i mean andy gray is an interesting character i mean obviously i've been playing with him and he's one of those names that his, his playing career his commentary and, and his personality that people know a lot about I mean, what what was he like to share? Uh, you know the, the the changing room with what what kind of guy actually is Andy Gray? Absolutely top draw, winner. Um, you kn you knew, and this is what you see John Barnwell knew, because when he bought him from Ever uh, from Aston Villa, um, he still had problems with. I don't think it's a secret now. He still had problems with his his, his knees and ankles, so they was he missing in there. And I don't really think he would have passed. I don't think he passed the medical, even though it was a record fee at the time. I've got a feeling he didn't actually pass the medical, but it was kind of well. John Barnwell says I want him, um, and he knew what he was going to get from Andy. Um, he knew how to look after him. He didn't. Um, he didn't train out if if he wasn't 100 percent. he didn't train with the lads he'll just do a bit on his own or he'll have some treatment and he'll get out but the big thing with andy is 
you knew when he played and he played most of the time you knew when mm. he played you knew you knew that you knew what you were going to get that he was an absolute uh absolute warrior basically um great player great in the air um i was half decent in the air but um for somebody that's not six foot yeah. And I was about five ten and a half, five eleven. Andy's five eleven. John Richards probably the same. We're all similar. Um, but Andy was just different class in the air. He just timed things to perfection, and he was brave as, as I say, I to call him a warrior. Uh, if you wanted to go into battle with with two players at your side, Andy Gray and John Richards fitted the bill because they you you know we're always usually playing against big tough six foot plus center backs but none of them got the better of andy uh, no, the bravery mark, the, and commitment bravery and commitment seemed to be his by word you know well that's right and um you knew what you were going to get and all the lads knew and uh but he, he he was supportive of all the players um he was he was the, the pin-up boy, so to speak, at the time. There was a lot in the papers about different things going on off the pitch. But, yeah. but in the dressing room and with the lads, he was just one of the lads. Total respect. There wasn't any uh, – people would think from the outside, oh, he's a bit of a big head. Far from it. He was just absolutely down to earth and supported, did what he could for the younger lads, give them the right advice. Uh, he, was, he was just absolutely top bloke. Top draw, Andy. Absolutely. And, and he played alongside, obviously, himself and John Richards. Now, John Richards, up until Steve Bull, was the, the Wolves' record goal scorer. Um, and uh, an, an, an incredible footballer, with technically and, and pace as well. I mean, that must have been quite something to be working with a man of, of that level of ability. Well, obviously, I'd seen John Richards from the first his first games when he got in the team. Because for 10 years, I stood on the terraces mainly the North Bank, watching a lot of the players that I was going to play with. I didn't know it, but 10 years on the terraces. And then suddenly I'm, I'm working with these guys day in, day out. <laughs> and then eventually I'm actually playing in the first team with them, you know, after a couple of years. And you're thinking, wow. Um, but you, you, you soon found out how good they were. You could see how good they were, but it's only when you actually play with them that you realise – how good they really were. Yeah. Um, you know, you're De your Derek Parkins, uh, Derek Parkins, Jeff Palmer, Frank Monroe. What a centre back. John McCall, the same. Scouse, absolutely different class, these these players. Willie, Willie Carr, um, you talk about, you talk about um, somebody like Joe Martino now for Wolves. Willie Carr was exact, was in the same mould as Joe Martino. Willie Carr was that good. Kenny Hibbett covers, you know, talk about box-to-box -box midfielders that can do everything, score goals from everywhere. Kenny Hibbett. That's the kind of player that we would that that would make a real impression on the team now, added to the squad, added to what we've got to give us that to give us little options and what have you. Um a Kenny Hibbett adding to the team now would, would be absolutely ideal. Kenny Hibbett, I think. Would have, would make a massive difference to any side, um, you oh, know. From, no, from his, his voice quality was something, and, and that takes us on to you know. I want to briefly talk about this because I'm going to make sure we've got enough time to talk about Melly's after football because that is just as interesting, if not if not more in some ways. But but players of, of your generation, a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, and people say, oh well, they'd never make it in today's Premier League, or the technical side's moved on, the fitness, blah blah blah. What's your response to that? Um, well, that, the, the, those kind of um, uh, ideas or, or that kind of uh, question was all, was asked to me when I played. When I played, they said, "Oh, would would the would the Billy?" Well, we were always we were always told, "Oh, you're not as good as uh, Billy Wright or Johnny Hancock or Jimmy Mullen," you know. Yeah. But it was a case of would the players from yesteryear make it today because the fitness regime's better, the game's quicker and all this business. But it's a bit like saying would would Jesse Owens in 1920s or whatever or 1930s, 20s, 30s, who was the 
the 100 meter champion then oh well he wouldn't compete now because they compare the times that he put up on there but he was the world champion he was the quickest thing on the planet so therefore yeah he is going to compete because everything got everything moves forward the nutrition moves forward the way everything to prepare the players moves forward so i yeah. i i think that the if if the players you you can only play in your era hmm. but there would be just it'd be just as good now that uh, that that adapt that play there would be some players that would have to adapt the game you know speaking to some, obviously some of the center backs saying uh let me know i could have to change my game mel because uh you used to be able to get away with it. The first ten or fifteen minutes, you could kick, you could kick the, the opposing forward or the winger all over the place because the referee would go, "Just calm down." Then he, then you'd get a warning, one more, and I might have to book you, and yeah. whatever. But but now you could just miss time, miss time your first tackle, and you can get sent off. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You can't even, you can't even, you can't even let let the opposition know you're there. So he says the game's changed as far as that's concerned, obviously. And, and put, putting the reducer in, as Ron Atkinson used to call it. Yeah, that's right. And or some of the managers used to say to the fullbacks, let the let let your opposing winger know you know you're there. First chance you get, first chance you get. If you can get, if you can get the ball and the man, and put the man in row Z with a clean tackle at the same time, he said, that's 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 number one. He says, but if it's number two, make sure, but it can't be number three. Because number three yeah. is the ball gets past you and the man gets past you. He said, that's not allowed. He said, the <laughs> ball can get past, the man can get past, but not the man and the ball at the same time. Seems good good logical management. That I, I think I subscribe to that. But before yeah. we move on to other things, well, quick question about football today. VAR. What an outstanding advance it is, isn't it? Isn't it a great well, thing? It, look, VAR is like all the, the great advances in, in technology that we've got. There's nothing wrong with the technology. It's just the way that it's used. Same with everything. You could you could invent the, the greatest, um, uh, you know, tech technology. There's there's what you call laser laser. Uh, scalpels and what have you that are absolutely wonderful in the right hands in the right in a uh, a top surgeon's hands it can save many people's lives and and do, do the world a good in the wrong person's hands it can be cause chaos <laughs> uh, it, you know it can obviously it can, it can obviously uh, in it yeah so it depends what intent and who's using the technology now the big thing is it needs to be used for me the first thing that needs to be looked at are the laws of the game the laws yeah. of the game surrounding handball in the penalty area regarding penalties etc needs to be over overall hauled and got back to some basic common sense of what it, of of how everybody that plays the game and watches the game and that we would all agree are uh, it's common sense because some of the yes. penalties that are given you're thinking well how on earth could that lad get a, get out the way from a yard away Ridiculous, and, isn't it? and how they can class some body positions as being oh well that's an unnatural position because mm. because it's getting to a stage now where players as soon as they get back into their own in and in and around their own penalty area start start moving like penguins they've got their hands blooming pressed behind down to their sides or be, or that that try and hold them behind their back you know and they're trying to then play the game properly so they can't actually just balance themselves yeah. and you're thinking it's and i'm thinking if anything's unnatural it's holding your it's trying to play the game with your with your arms tied behind your back yeah exactly and, uh, and it's it's causing such a crazy situations because players are that frightened or paranoid about giving a, a penalty away. Yeah. And we've got to we've got to get the game back to 
common sense, how it used to be, um, use v VAR properly, um, and, we're, and we need to be coming to decisions that are, um, ultimately, it's the referee's, ult the referee on the pitch's ultimate say, but he needs to be helped and guided and assisted. That's why it's called video assistant referee, VAR. He needs to be assisted because that was the idea to give the fact that if if the guy on the pitch had a player run across him or he didn't quite or he dropped his whatever just at the wrong moment, oh, come on, help me out, will you? Uh, was that a penalty? Because I don't want to say I didn't see it, so I can't give it. That's what it's there for. Not, yeah. but it's not that it's not there to make stupid interpretations of stupid laws and that's what they've got to change really they've got to sit down and they've got to get to the bottom of this with the law because they've changed the laws again uh, the laws again um and i know wolves for instance came out really poorly last season with with the the changes in the law um i remember the first game against uh away at leicester and Willie Willie Bolly was judged to have handled the ball, and he didn't know anything about it. He got his back to the ball, back to the back, back to it, and it hit him on his back, right at the top of his arm, and um, it bounced down. And then Donka put the ball in. Yeah. And everybody's Jamie Vardy's waiting to kick off. He's saying to the referee, "Come on, ref, we've got to get a goal back here. Come on, let's kick off." In other words. We can't see anything wrong with it. What's the what's the problem? And then eventually, after a few minutes, sorry, we've ruled it out and ball, and everybody's going scratching their head. It's crazy. I, I, th I actually think I saw a chart that showed that if they hadn't been for VAR last season, Wolves would have been on the verge of the Champions League. It does it doesn't even itself out. That's but, right. I think I think we could have been in the top four. You're right. Yeah, but well, we're deep into the second half, and I know you've got a you've got a speciality of scoring important goals late in the game. So I want to talk about the three oh. E's, and I want to talk about Melly's I want to performance. Talk about the th I've got one and as well. Uh, oh, I, I can't imagine where you got it, mate. Well, I don't know. This, this just it's just what a coincidence. Well, Melly's performance specialist, the three E's. What you've been doing since you finished football, because it's fascinating, and we're deeper into the second half than I wanted. So I'm going to shut up a bit now. I want to I want to hear all about what you've been doing and how this what this is about. Well, my last game for Wolves was at, at Watford, um, sixth of sixth uh, of May, 1984. Twelve minutes past three. Bang! I ruptured my Achilles. That was the last game I played for Wolves. I was 27. I'd got into the team when I was 21. I had six seasons, played 214 games, scored 53 goals for Wolves. I loved every second of it. I was so blessed to play for my hometown club. And then it finished, as I say, at Vicarage Road. That was the last time I pulled on that famous old gold and black shirt for Wolves first team. Yeah. And... Um, To cut a long story short, really, that took me on. I, I, I stayed in the game. I got back. I played back six months later after rupturing the Achilles. But I was rupturing my Achilles. But I was never the same. Never got back to the same kind of fitness. Got back fit at Manchester City. Played three games for Manchester City Reserve. Scored three goals. But then I wasn't. Still wasn't hundred percent fit. But I did get. I got an offer from Sheffield United in Porterfield. So I went to. Uh, I went there because I had a chat with Man City and they said, well, you're not quite fit enough yet, Mel. We can't offer you anything. I went, well, well, they're going to offer me something. So I did. I went there um, and that was in Division 2 or the Championship as it is now. Great club. Loved every minute of it. Ian Porterfield, lovely man. Uh, sadly lost him too early as well. Um, and um, had a not great time there. Um, then had more injuries groin injuries different things couldn't quite get fit um went to Sh gillingham with keith peacock had a great couple of years there tried to get fit couldn't get fit and i had to finish when i was 31 32 having uh some time at west brom 
when big Ron Atkinson invited me down there uh, to try and get back and um, and then at Warsaw at the old fellows park played a yeah. lot of reserve games but couldn't get fit enough to get in the first team so I had to retire but that sparked my curiosity on how we perform as human beings because I was really trying to get back but there wasn't the internet then there wasn't I, I just had to speak to uh, to doctors to uh, specialists um, get little pamphlets and what have you sent through the post uh, but you couldn't really do the research that you can do now on the internet but then over the years that's got easier to do that so i've i've actually been all around the world a lot of the time uh you know when i've been a football agent so i've studied how uh, they've done things with of with the brazilian coaches i've been to italy a lot i've been to the states studying how we perform and all uh spoke with coaches in all the the top baseball teams american football teams how the, how do you perform under pressure so I've studied probably 20 to 30 different modalities or techniques of how to get us as human beings in what you call a flow state or in the zone. For instance, when I scored that overhead kick, I didn't know it at the time, but I can explain it now. When I scored that kick, that overhead kick against um, Swindon to take us into extra time, which then uh, gave John Riches the chance to score in extra time to take us to Wembley. I was in, I was absolutely in the zone when I executed that overhead kick. Um, I've got a picture in this book of somebody else in the zone executing a perfect overhead kick. Yeah. It happens to be Ronaldo. <laughs> Not me, but it's can't exactly, tell the difference now. But uh, thanks, Bill. You could at, at a glance you couldn't tell, could you? But no. it just exemplifies exactly what I'm saying. In that, when I remember, I just did it without thinking. Yeah. It just came naturally, instinctively. I just did it. Didn't ask anybody. I didn't say what's the best thing to do now. I didn't look for any guidance from the one of my other one of the other lads or whatever who go go on have a shot, Mel. Uh, no, I just did it, and that's what that's where we perform is we get in flow or in the zone or present. In other words, we are totally and utterly present, and that's the that is the state where we perform, but. It's not easy, otherwise everybody do it, to understand how to get into that state of being in the zone. And that's why, um, as I say, I've, I've, I've worked with lots of people from different fields and I've, uh, I've written this book. I'm writing a longer book, but this is more of a, a how-to book because it's only 30-odd pages, but it's filled You've got it. It's filled. It's not a. There's not loads of stories in there. In this one, is there? It's just no. how. It's just really little bullet points, how tos, and there's lots of what I call aha moments in there. Ah, that's a good point, which will get people to look it a little bit deeper into that subject. Um, but it just gives you a basics of, especially, on. Uh, the three E's are, it's just my take on how we exercise, what we eat, and also controlling our emotions. It's all about emotional intelligence. And I'm saying about emotional intelligence, I've mentioned some of the, the players that I played with. They did this, auto, they just automatically did this every game. Some of the, the players I'm talking about, like your Andy Gray's. He could literally not train all week, not because he didn't want to, but because his body wouldn't let him with his knee or ankle or whatever. And so he'd do everything he could. But the manager, because we, the players, but and the manager in particular, trusted him completely, he knew what he was going to get. You knew you were going to get a, a performance 
for 90 minutes or 90 plus minutes because he could he, you've got to go out there and they talk about it now you've got to compete it's all about we have to it's all about competing but if anybody was in the zone about competing it was your Andy Gray's your John Richards yeah your em, your Emlyn Hughes your, your Derek Parkins of this world Kenny Ibbitt Willie Carr Mel Eves Mel Eves most of the time <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Well, as I recall, virtually all the time, Mel. But you know, I've been modest as always. But I think yeah, it's important those those who are watching. I, I want to, I want them to know that Mel is available on social media. If you want to contact him to talk about the book, or if you want to talk talk to him about any of the any of these subjects, because we've we've only just touched the iceberg. We've got only got a couple of minutes left. Right. Tell, well, tell us some more about your philosophy on this, Mel. Because I think well, it's we've touched it. We've touched it. If anybody. Any anybody listening, looking, wants a copy of the wants a copy of the book. You can get a copy of the ebook because this is the, the, there are one or two uh, paperback versions, but you can actually get the ebook and read all about it uh, by just going st straight to my website, which is meleves m e l e v e s dot com. Dead simple. If you have to put www dot in front of it, but I don't think you do nowadays, do you? So it's just meleves dot com, and then you'll just just down, just scroll down uh, a jot, and it'll you'll see this picture, and then you just put your name, name and email address in, and you get your book. And, and I can vouch for the fact, having spoken to Mel in depth about much of the stuff that's in this book and, and much else besides that he, he, he talks about and, and teaches. Uh, it is really, really useful, not just for sport, but for life. In fact, more importantly, life, you know, and, and I think on that note, as well as the last couple of minutes, Mel, what, what would your sort of parting words be to anyone out there who's, who's you know, they're finding it difficult at the moment. They, they need to get in the zone, but there's so much going on around them, you know. Well, first of all, first of all, get my ebook. Have a look. Look especially at the, the third section, which is control emotional intelligence or controlling your emotions under pressure. And it's all about getting in the zone or in flow. And it's really all about letting go of the blocks. And the, there are some key phrases in there that everything is an inside out job. It means that we create our reality. Now, that might sound a little bit woo-woo to start with, but um, it doesn't to me, obviously, because I've studied this for over 30, 30, 40 years now. Probably, yeah, over 30 years anyway. And um, it is. Once you, once you set out, and I know this is, what, this is what the players, the top players that I played with during my career did even if they didn't know what they did. And I didn't know too much about it then when I pl was playing. I started to learn towards the end of my career because I was picking picking various things up. Um, but the big thing is what you think about comes about. Your attitude determines your altitude. In other words, how you, what you're thinking, how you uh, think determines how far you go in your life, how far you go. But I've taught uh, and helped and lectured from football teams to, to youngsters, 10, 11, 12, 13, to uh, really kind of what you would call stayed businessmen, all in the business suits and ties and, uh, all the way through to helping the mom get us get her kids to school on time because that's a result because it's all about it's a it's a results business and um, that's the title of my next book so if you want to get results it's all about questioning your beliefs because beliefs lead to thoughts Thoughts lead to words. Words form, uh, leads to actions. Actions over a period of time form our habits because we are creatures of habit. Habits form our character because I've met, I've, 
I've interviewed dozens of football managers and they've all said the big thing is you've got to have the right characters in your dressing room. And that's what we had at Wolves, certainly when we were winning stuff. Um, and I've mentioned quite a few of them. And our character gives us our destiny and the results in three main areas, which is our health, our career stroke wealth and our relationships. And everything else stems from them. And whether, as I say, uh, whether you want whether you want to perform yourself or you want your team to perform, whether that be a, a business team, a sales team, a football team, whatever team, or you just want to get out yourself out of the depression that you're in. I'm there. To, I'm there to help. Go to my website. Um, I will be doing loads of. There will be loads of f f free stuff because I want to just get the message out there. Um, I want to get the message out there and help as many people as I can. Uh, and I know Bill's the same. He's he's got a heart oh, of gold, and that's why that's why I'm on here talking to the top man himself. So we just we, and I say that I can talk for Bill. We just want to get the message out and help as many people as we can. Uh, here, here, Mel. Th thank you for that, mate. And uh, it's it's a real pleasure to to have the same someone thinking the same way. And I can recommend to anyone. I've, I've gone with uh, Mel on some of his lectures, some of his talks. I recommend it for anyone. Do look it up. He's not just an interesting guy about football. This stuff, we've only just skimmed the iceberg on it. There's so much more. But we've run out of time. In fact, we've over overrun our time. So uh, I'm going to have to cut, cut it short. Now, whenever we talk, I always feel like an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. It just isn't enough. Um, you know, we could be until midnight. But I'm going to have to wrap it up and just say, from me and everyone at Open Dialogue, just and all the people who will watch this eventually and please folks do watch this subscribe to open dialogues and share this around on your social media to help us keep doing things like this mel Eves, thank you so much for not just this hour not just the great memories you've shared with us but the work you're doing now thanks so much mate thanks bill and thanks for what you're doing as well and that's good night from us to all of you